If your child is considering something as big as joining the military, you can bet they're taking the time to do some research. You can too by visiting todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. Experiences are what people love the most about travel. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania or enjoying the views while cruising on a catamaran in the Caribbean. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10. That's V-I-A-T-O-R-10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello again, and thank you as always for joining us on this, the Space Nuts podcast, episode 206. It's all about astronomy. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. (laughs) Hi, Andrew. We do 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 a bit of space science as well as astronomy, so... (laughs) Indeed. We we cover all that. we do. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Now, I'm I'm just back from my Not Canada tour. I'm supposed to be in Canada and Alaska at the moment, but I don't know why, but we had to cancel. No. uh, um, Yeah, something's going on. (laughs) Yeah. So we did a not Canada tour and uh, and just did a little. Uh, now that they've opened up the roads in our state and we can travel a bit, uh, we visited some family and friends. So we did a, a a trip to Maitland, then down to Sydney to see the boys, and then cut back through the mountains and visited friends in Orange and Bathurst before heading home. So uh, instead of nineteen days in Canada, Alaska, we did three days in New South Wales or part thereof, <laughs> and uh, we called it the Not Canada Tour. <laughs> Very good. Well, that's all right. Um, I, I, it was nice, though. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was probably a lot less uncomfortable here and there as well, like the sitting on the flight and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that. But uh, I'll tell you what was uncomfortable was uh, we were in Sydney around the time of those uh, those protests. Yeah. I won't get into the politics of that. But social distancing seems to have just gone out the window. Oh, and oh, I yeah. found that a little concerning. Yeah. So um, I, it was not not a good feeling around Sydney on the weekend, I must say. Well, in my bit of Sydney, it's really good. Everybody stays apart. But, yes, you're right, mm. right in the centre and especially with a, a busy weekend like that, very much so. Anyway. Yes, indeed. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's get down to business. We've got uh, a lot to talk about, including one of my favourite subjects, the space doogie. Yep. Yes, it's back in the news, a mua mua. Uh, but uh, the reason it's in the news, to uh, steal one of uh, Fred's crutch lines, is that um, they have a new theory as to what it is coming out of the University of Chicago, I believe. We'll also be looking at an Earth like planet orbiting a sun like star you know fred there's a new book out that's got a similar story line <laughs> attached to it i can't remember the name of the thing um, uh, and we've got a couple of questions have we ever been visited by aliens i mean that's a pretty straight down the line yes or no answer i think but uh, <laughs> i'm sure we'll be able to put more into it than that and um, concerns about starlink the starlink satellites which we have talked about before but uh, it's an ongoing issue in fact i read another story about it during the week which um, raised uh, a few questions as well. So, Fred, let's uh, get down to business. A new theory about our exo-asteroid Oumuamua, affectionately known in the uh, astronomical world as the Space Doogie. Andrew, there's well, only... at least by one person exactly. who's not an astronomer. <laughs> there's one person who calls it that. Now, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> I have no idea. I um, no, I still go with the, uh, the the French breadstick analogy, uh, which <laughs> it's just, 
seems much more wholesome somehow. But that, of course, <laughs> both of us are wrong. Um, the uh, yeah, the, the the famous Oumuamua, the the first messenger from afar, discovered back in 1917. <clears throat> Hard to believe it's <clears throat> excuse me, getting on for three years ago. It was October. <clears throat> I'm sorry, forgive my uh, froggy throat. October the 19th, 2017. Um, that Oumuamua was picked up and instantly recognised by astronomers as having come from outside the solar system because of its hyperbolic orbit, um, but uh, also highly studied, um, in particular its light curve that demonstrated that this was an object that was not circular, uh, that was, t um, you know, kind of basically spinning end over end as it moved uh, through the solar system and, and the, the light that we saw from it varied as the, as, as the sunlight um, reflected from it increased and decreased because of the, uh, the shape of it. So, yeah, this uh, elongated shape. And the thing that, um, you know, you and I have talked about many times before uh, that really set the cat among the pigeons as far as it being an alien spacecraft was concerned uh, was the fact that it was uh, experiencing uh, what we in the trade called non-gravitational perturbations, which is a fancy way of saying something was pushing it off its orbit. Um, and the, uh, the, the expected cause for that, which would be um, outgassing, basically, which is what comets do, uh, as mm. the ices melt as they get near the sun, or the ice is sublime as they get near the sun, that outgassing uh, will will change the orbit of something. So uh, everybody looked very closely for signs of uh, of uh, you know either dust or gas coming off this thing, and none were found. It was uh, simply a, a spot of light. So that. Uh, led to the idea of alien spacecraft. Uh, and, of course, the world's radio telescopes beamed in on it and nothing was heard. Uh, so uh, it's only uh, it's probably only two people uh, in the world who think it's an alien spacecraft. You might be one of them. Um, I'm not the other. Uh, it, but, uh, you know, so uh, theories have abounded. And, in fact, you and I, I think, have talked about most of them. I think, Andrew, you and I have spoken more about Oumuamua than anything else. And it's just so that you can get that line in at the beginning. Um, Absolutely true. Although I, th I think black holes probably are the number one topic yeah, on space nuts. That's right. Yes. Okay. All right. Let, let's put it this way. Any other object in the solar system, even though it's probably, I mean, it's heading out of the solar system because it, it's not a permanent member. So mm. uh, the theories for what it was or what it is uh, uh, basically usually involved uh, an asteroid from another solar system maybe one that has undergone a collision and hence it's been flung out of the solar system. Uh, there was a story I think we covered a few weeks ago which suggested that maybe what we were seeing here was the result of a collision of two planetesimals. These are the, you know, the building blocks of planets in another solar system uh, because there's some evidence that the debris of that might be shard-like might be this sort of shape uh, and so I think we confidently um, uh, came to the conclusion that's probably what it was uh, but now there's another conclusion for us to come to and I like this one very much because it gets okay. right sorry go, go ahead no I'm just interested to know what it is okay <laughs> sorry uh, it's um, it, it it gets right to the you know to a fundamental level in um, in in uh, astronomical maybe the the science of the way solar systems evolve it goes right back to the beginning because we know that uh, star formation regions are often associated with uh, what we call giant molecular clouds these are giant clouds uh, of molecular hydrogen so hydrogen atoms join together to make H two the hydrogen molecule the most common molecule in the universe. Uh, it's, uh, so it's everywhere. And these giant molecular clouds are very significant items within our galaxy. Uh, as I said, they're, uh, you know, they're associated with star formation. So what has been proposed is that this object, Oumuamua, actually comes from one of those. Um, and in, in, indeed, the idea is that you've got molecular hydrogen, perhaps in the core of one of these uh, giant molecular clouds, which is so cold um, that the hydrogen has solidified. And so you've got, a, uh, as, as the lead author on, on this um, 
uh, on this uh, paper, uh, said he described it as a frozen iceberg of molecular hydrogen. That's uh, Daryl Seligman, uh, who's um, actually, uh, he's, I think he might be at Yale, but he's on his way to the U University of Chicago. Um, it, 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 he says, this explains every mysterious property about it. And if it's true, it's likely that the galaxy is full of similar objects. So what, what did explain? Okay, okay, okay. Go on. So <laughs> in terms of a normal asteroid, which, which is sort of dust and ice, this is a completely different animal. T totally different. Nothing to do with planets or collisions of planets, uh, but basically something that has spilled out of a giant molecular cloud, maybe by, wow. you know, by, maybe by a collision between two of these things. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the key thing uh, that this, ex, you know, this, this theory offers uh, to, our, to, to, to our understanding is that if it's outgassing molecular hydrogen as it passes near the sun, Basically, that's not going to show any visible sign. And in particular, there's no dust particles involved. There's, there's, there's actually no dust in this thing, uh, unlike um, uh, you know, a comet, which is basically a, a ball of ice uh, with dust bound into it. Um, this thing is just hydrogen. Uh, so um, what they have done is you know, looked at the, the detail, the physics of how this might behave. Um, the, 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 there's no light, there's nothing to burn, doesn't reflect light, so you can't detect it. Um, and you only get this stuff, molecular hydrogen ice, forming really almost at absolute zero. It's just a little bit above absolute zero. Uh, so these things are perhaps being formed in the cores of giant uh, the cores that C O R E S of giant molecular clouds these you know these places that are where stars are born so uh, it, it it is an astonishing idea but it fits all the bills it fits the um, uh, it fits the idea of the acceleration fits fits the fact that we couldn't see anything outgassing um, there's a nice explanation for the shape of it as well uh, because. Um, the, uh, I don't think it'll beat my theory, but let's go for it. <laughs> uh, author Daryl Seligman, uh, he's, he's, he, puts it, uh, he puts it beautifully. So what you've got is, you know, this thing's being irradiated as it passes through the solar system, and maybe it's gone through many solar systems, we don't know, but, but, or, or at least passed nearby to stars. So it's being irradiated with the, both the particles and uh, the uh, radiation, you know, the electromagnetic radiation from these stars. And what it does, what that does is just sort of, um, as he puts it, whittles away the surface. And so, so this is what he describes. He says, imagine what happens to a bar of soap. It starts out as a fairly regular rectangle, but you use it up and it gets smaller and thinner over time. Uh, uh, so he says... Um, <laughs> Muamua uh, has basically, you know, been wandering through space. This thing got smacked like a bug on a wind windshield, he says. And and what he's suggesting is that uh, as it, you know, it encounters the solar system, the radiation from the sun actually uh, helps to increase this this uh, slimming down process that gives you this this very odd shape. R really neat theory. Um, Problem is that's as far as it goes. We can't really say any more because this thing's gone. Uh, however, we should be looking out for more. And um, a few commentators have, have mentioned that the, you know, the observatory or the telescope that will really bring these things home in, in terms of our discovery of them is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, formerly the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, scheduled to be online in a couple of years' time, hopefully. And that will, I think, net many interstellar objects, whether they're asteroids or icebergs from giant molecular clouds, maybe we'll find out then. Yeah, and you did say something that um, I, I was going to ask you about, but I, I want to go back to it, and that was you said that these um, these things come from the same clouds that form stars. Now, 
um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, those stars collapse, uh, those clouds collapse under their own gravity and that, that creates stars, which, you know, is super heat. And yet these are at the opposite of the sc- uh, scale. Yeah. So it just seems sort of counterproductive. No, it's a, a great a great point. Um, so I guess what you're talking about is where, you know, it, it depends on the on the density, on the, the amount of compression that there's been. So where the stars are forming, um, you've got really high densities of hydrogen and helium. Uh, that collapse under gravitation is what basically uh, switches on star formation. But um, these molecular clouds are vast, vast places. And you know, you know, when you when you think of things like the picture of the um, of the, the pillars of creation, um, the star formation in there is only happening. Uh, right at the tips of those pillars of creation, uh, there's, there's an enormous amount of stuff around them, uh, and the, these molecular clouds are almost certainly have areas that are very, very cold indeed, uh, and that's what you know what they're suggesting. So I think okay. you can have both. So, they, so these yeah. clouds produce both. Yes, that's right. Who knows what else they might be producing? Exactly. What else is in there? <laughs> but I do like the idea of hydrogen icebergs. That's that's one I've not heard of before, and I think is relatively new to the um, scientific community. At least the you know the, the the ones who are not concentrating on giant molecular clouds. Very disappointed to uh, learn that it's probably not remnants of the dog star. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, there was another one more recently, so they're probably thinking the same thing about that one. That one is a comet, though. The other one's oh, got okay, all, okay. all the signs of a comet, yeah, and um, actually right. very similar uh, components to what comets in our own solar system uh, have. Um, yeah. so, so essentially there is still officially only one space doogie. There is indeed, that's right. One, oh. Only one fra- space breadstick as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, but yeah, as you say, uh, we'll be in a position soon to maybe find many, many more, and it stands to reason that there are probably billions of them, uh, given the size of the universe and how much junk is floating around out there, indeed. You're listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Roger, your lives are here also. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, I have got some exciting news. I know there's been a lot of exciting news with the Space Nuts podcast in recent times, but we have a new URL. Wow. Uh, instead of trying to spell out bytes.com slash space nuts to everybody, uh, we uh, can simply tell people to go to space nuts podcast.com. There you are, space nuts podcast.com. It's our brand new uh, website URL. Uh, we're sort of still in the design phase, but it is operational. So you can go on there and uh, have a look at um, all our episodes. They're all listed. Uh, you can um, visit the shop. You can see what's happening with uh, some of the things that are going on in the astronomical world that uh, we have reported or have uh, passed on through social media. Uh, and uh, so much more. So check it out. Uh, SpaceNutsPodcast.com is our new URL, and we'll be building on that uh, as time goes on. And as as the uh, uh, the, the well thought out and uh, descriptive uh, catchphrase we use to describe ourselves, our slogan: Astronomy, Space, Science, and Stuff <laughs> is, is what it's all about. Now, Fred, uh, this is another exciting story. <laughs> Sorry? I've just had a look. It looks great. It does. It's yeah. come up really well. Mm-hmm. That, and that logo, people talk about that logo so much. It's, um, yeah, my brother in his, uh, in his prime as a graphic artist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, now, let's um, talk about this uh, next story, which uh, I find fascinating in that they seem to have found an Earth like planet orbit- orbiting a sun like star. And that's prompted a few questions in my mind already. But w- what have we found here? Uh, exactly what you said. Yeah, this is uh, a, a, a sort of fairly well-known planetary system, extra, extrasolar planetary system, uh, called Kepler-160, uh, discovered by the, the Kepler spacecraft. Uh, for, I think, six years or so, uh, it's been known that Kepler-160 has two uh, orbiting planets, which are 
Kepler 160b and Kepler 160c, that's the normal nomenclature, um, which are actually close, much closer to their to, to uh, Kepler 160 uh, than the Earth is, and they're, they're bigger planets, and they would be very hot. Uh, really, not uh, not any kind of um, uh, place where we might think. Well, here's a here, you know here's an analog of Earth, um, but another one's now been found that looks very promising as a, a pretty good analog of our own planet. So the first thing to know is that unlike most of the stars which we know have planets around them, Kepler 160 is a sun-like star. It's the same class, uh, probably very, very similar surface temperature uh, to the sun, maybe just a smidgen more. Um, but uh, it's, it's not um, a red dwarf star, which is what most of the, the, the planetary hosts that have been found so far are. And the reason for that is it's easier to find a planet going around a red dwarf star uh, because the star's small and as the planet crosses in front of it, it produces a bigger dip in the in the light uh, output of the star. Uh, red dwarf stars are slightly peculiar, though, because even though they're cooler and smaller than the sun, they've got much more active surfaces, so lots of tangled magnetic fields, solar flares that make ours look fairly tame uh, from the sun. And people have, you know, astrobiologists have, have worried that this might rule out the idea of any life forms evolving on the planets of, of red dwarf stars. So that's why the idea of a, an Earth-like-ish planet, and, and I say that because it's thought to be almost twice as big as the Earth, about 1.9 times bigger than the Earth, but it's orbiting uh, a sun-like star and the critical thing, as you kind of hinted already, it's orbiting in the in the Goldilocks zone of the wow. star, the habitable zone. In fact, its year um, is not very different from ours. Its, uh, its year is 378 of our days. So that is, uh, you know, that makes it really interesting. Um, it, it's likely to have a similar surface temperature to to our own planet. In fact, I think I saw one suggestion that on average, it may well be about a, an, an average temperature of five degrees Celsius, which is actually lower than ours. We, we sit with an average surface temperature of, of 15 degrees. Um, but uh, five degrees, we're still above freezing and, um, you know, is interesting from an astrobiology point of view. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, I, I imagine the gravity would be uh, a, a, bit, a fair bit different. Would yeah, that be the case? Right. It's, it would. It would be uh, probably be higher. Um, it, it, a lot depends. You know, the, the 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 key thing really about whether this is a place that might host life is what the atmosphere is like. And mm. uh, at the moment, the observations that lead to the idea that this planet exists. Uh, that they're not um, certain. They, they, they put them at the 85% level uh, w uh, of probability that this is a real planet. And the reason I say that is that uh, its, it, it's um, effect on its parent star, as I mentioned earlier, because it's a sun-like star that it's crossing in front of, the dip in its in the in the star's brightness as this planet passes in front of it is very very small, and so it's still, you know, they're still teasing the signal out of the out of the noise. And the other thing, of course, is that with a period of three hundred and seventy eight days, that's how long you've got to wait between transits of the of the planet in front of its star. So it's quite a a slow job. It's a matter of some years that will be needed before this will be confirmed at the 99% level, which is what you need to, to give it a tick as a, a confirmed planet. So, so they're, the, they're, they're very, very sure it's a rocky planet, though, by the sound of it. Um, yes. No? Yes. No, I, no, I think you're right. Um, I, th I think that's that's correct, that it's very likely to be a rocky planet. A super Earth is is what these things are, uh, you know, classified as. Mm. Interesting stuff, though. And, and uh, once again, uh, as in so many of our stories, Andrew, it's a question of watching this space uh, because um, as more observations are gained, then we'll know more about it. But very is it, interesting. Is it close enough to, say, do some sort of spectrum analysis of its atmosphere and, and see what's going on there? 
it, it, it is uh, with the next generation of telescopes. Uh, it's actually quite a long way away. If I remember rightly, it's about 3,000 light years away, mm. uh, which is not nearby. <laughs> um, but with, particularly with the Kepler Space Telescope, that will... Uh, have the capability to to do a, um, infrared spectroscopy uh, on this object, um, and maybe we will discover more about it once that spacecraft is in orbit. And then, of course, further down the track, when we've got the uh, the, the three extremely large telescopes which are currently on the stocks, they too will contribute to this kind of science. So we'll certainly find out more about it, um, but maybe not uh, within the next few months. I think it'll be down the track. Yeah, but it's in the right place, and yep. uh, you know everything adds up. And look, let's face it: there there, ha- there have to be Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars out there. Um, probably squillions of them, but uh, you know they've, they're few and far between as far as our observations are concerned, and that's what makes it um, difficult. And I guess for a lot of people frustrating because we want to find them. We want to find planets in habitable zones because that just sort of opens the door a bit more to the possibility that there could be some form of life out beyond our uh, solar system and you know analyzing the atmosphere could could provide telltale signs could yeah, exactly that's that's what um that's what we're all looking forward to <laughs> now i've thought of another reason why we wouldn't want to live on this planet even if it could harbor life aside from its um, its gravity which i think might be a bit stifling yeah. uh, at a um rotational uh, year of 378 days i think you said uh, you get ripped off if you, you know, let's 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 just ballpark the figure of the average age of a human being uh, at 80, uh, on that planet you'd only live 76.8 years. So there's another reason not to go. Yeah, yeah. That's a bit close to the bone for me, that. <laughs> uh, dear. It's the same amount of time for Yeah, you. I know. <laughs> it doesn't, just doesn't sound that way. Yeah. No, it it's like putting the car on cruise control. You feel like you're going slowly, but you really are doing the same speed. Yeah, exactly. Mm. All right. Uh, hopefully there'll be more to tell on this particular uh, planet, uh, which uh, sounds very exciting indeed. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with the great Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, I've mentioned many times that if you would like to become a patron, you can do that uh, through uh, patreon.com slash space nuts. You can also do it through Supercast. But uh, now our distributor Acast is offering a, a similar option, which you can find out on our uh, website, the new URL I mentioned earlier, spacenutspodcast.com. So if you're interested in contributing to the program for uh, you know a few dollars a month, uh, you can check out any of those options. And we do like to sincerely say thank you to our patrons uh, for supporting the Space Nuts podcast, whether it's through Patreon, Supercast or Acast. Uh, They're all uh, options for you. Uh, And as I've said many times, not mandatory, but you can uh, contribute to the Space Nuts podcast for as little as $3 a month. And uh, whatever you decide to do, um, we are eternally grateful. Thank you very, very much for supporting us. Now, uh, Fred, we have some questions to answer, and uh, we appreciate those as well. Uh, This one comes from Mike on the Isle of Wight. Hello, Mike. I've only recently discovered your podcast, and he's still listening. It's just amazing. And I think it's great, a sensible mix of humour and fact, a great listen. Isn't that nice? Uh, Now, um, my question is, why didn't the professional astronomy community react earlier to the um, uh, protest Uh, about the likes of Starlink, uh, when, as far as I understand it, the intentions were known back in 2015. It's all a a bit uh, late now to start decrying it. Uh, As an amateur astronomer uh, or astrophotographer, I think, uh, I'm used to having a uh, to dump a few images of a session due to satellites, but uh, in the near future, I might uh, myself uh, find myself dumping more and more um, and it's a depressing thought. All the best, keep up the good work. He's brought a, a very interesting point up, one you and I have discussed before, uh, in that um, the, these satellite launches are just um, filling the sky with thousands of satellites. And, yes, are we going to face that problem? I know astronomers are certainly very much concerned about it. 
We are. That's right. Um, so, uh, but um, Mike makes a a really good point. Um, why didn't the professional astronomy community react earlier to protest about the likes of Starlink when, as I understand it, the intentions were known back in 2015? So um, it, I've basically looked for, um, you know, looked for whatever message that was in 2015. And you, you're probably right, Mike, there was probably an, an announcement from SpaceX because these things do tend to happen. But Somehow that did not filter through to the astronomical community. Uh, so we were all taken by surprise when the first batch of 60 were launched um, late last year. Was that right? That's when it was, November, I think. Um, and, you know, it's uh, and it really has become a, a big issue in terms of light pollution as you're, as you're experiencing yourself as, a, as an astrophotographer. Um, so I, I guess um, rather than kind of, rake over the ashes of whatever the history is, uh, which I have tried to do but not been too successful with, really what we've got to be looking at is how we deal with this in the future. And the good news is that um, SpaceX are engaged with this problem. They realise that there is an issue here. They themselves have said that their satellites are brighter than they expected them to be. Uh, and they see the problem. They understand that astronomers are not happy about this and are uh, essentially attempting to mitigate it. Uh, uh, still, the work is still in progress on that. Um, so the latest news on that is that uh, last week there was the eighth uh, launch of 60 uh, spacecraft, 60 satellites. Uh, that brings the total now to 482, I think it is, because two were launched initially before the first big dollop of 60. Um, but one of the current uh, um, batch of, of, uh, of 60 satellites has been fitted with uh, a, a sort of prototype sun shield, um, so uh, it, it's it's a sort of visor um, that basically is is aimed at reducing the light that's falling on the spacecraft, so you don't get this bright reflection. Uh, and as I've said, the the, the mission last week uh, included one of these Starlink spacecraft equipped with a visor to see what happens. So um, they will. Uh, actually, if if that works, um, it's SpaceX's vice president of satellite government relations, um, Patricia Cooper, who I think has figured quite largely in this discussion. Um, she said that once they get the current design of spacecraft out of the way, and there are 80 more to come, uh, then all the spacecraft will be fitted with these sunshades if, if they work. So mm. they, are, they, are, they are working on it. And um, you know, that's all good news. Uh, it's still not the ideal situation. Uh, there have been a number of times, and you and I think have spoken about this too, Andrew, um, the, a number of organisations, including the International Astronomical Union, uh, the European uh, Southern Observatory, have basically put out statements about this. They've done calculations that show uh, exactly what the effect will be. And it's the, it's the wide-angle telescopes that are at the biggest, uh, the wide-angle imaging telescopes that are at the biggest risk. Uh, the most prominent of those is one we've already, already mentioned in this uh, episode of Space Nuts. That's the Vera C. Rubin uh, wide field telescope which will come online in a couple of years but the amateur world also uses wide field imaging telescopes so it is going to be a problem for you know for astronomers like mike and we will just have to learn to live with it i think uh, it will be great if the sun shades actually do the job um can i can i just add a, a little um you know postscript to this story andrew which is not really about the the issue in in hand mm. but um i like the fact that and this comes from a sustainability viewpoint uh that the recent launch the launch last week of the uh, latest batch of 60 starlink satellites was using a booster a first stage that had already flown four times uh, so it's uh, had its fifth mission and landed successfully, uh, and not on um, on the barge, which is called, of course, I still love you, 
uh, it landed on the barge called "Just Read the Instructions." These are these are the um, the drone ships that uh, that uh, Elon Musk's organisation uses to capture them back. Yeah. And just um, I think we we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, but the the rocket that was used to launch the Demo Two. Uh, uh, into orbit, the Crew Dragon with uh, Bob uh, Benken and Doug Hurley on board. That was a brand new one. It hadn't been used before, uh, which is probably a good thing. Yes, indeed. A couple of other things about this before we um, end the story. Uh, one of the other aspects of this that uh, I suppose uh, could be raised is um, is space junk. And uh, one of the interesting um, aspects of this is that they've already considered that and apparently, uh, according to their website, at the end of life, the satellites, uh, satellites will use their onboard propulsion system to de-orbit over the course of a few months um, and in the unlikely event the propulsion system becomes inoperable, the satellites will burn up in Earth's atmosphere within one to five years, significantly less than the hundreds or thousands of years required at higher altitudes. So they're designed to self immolate yeah. <laughs> and, um, and and not become a problem yeah. in orbit. And these are in low Earth orbit, about 550 kilometres. So they are designed to sort of not stay up there and cause problems, which is a very, very good thing just in case people were wondering. And, of yeah. course, the reason they're doing all of this, uh, Fred, as you and I have discussed, is to deliver high-speed broadband internet to locations where access has been unreliable, expensive or completely unavailable. So there are good reasons behind it, but with um, the number of satellites they're putting up there, of course there are issues and concerns, which is what uh, has been raised uh, in uh, the question we got. So, uh, Mike, hopefully that uh, covers some of the issues. Um, it might be one where you just have to grit your teeth and get on with it by the sound of things. Now, uh, Fred, uh, sorry, you were saying? Uh, just with the, the mantra, uh, Mike, you are not alone. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, we've got a, a question, uh, and thanks for the question, uh, Mike. Uh, we've got a question now from Kerry, who's in Port St Lucia in Florida. Hi, Kerry. Thanks for the question. Um, he says, love the show. We receive new episodes on Thursday via iHeartRadio. So uh, that's always a big day for me. Uh, very good. Uh, as much as I enjoy ancient aliens on the History Channel, it seems highly improbable that laws of physics as we know them allow so great a distance to be travelled by space travellers, unless you're writing science fiction books where those questions are just open-ended you don't have to answer them. Fred, do you think it's possible that we have been visited by aliens? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> it is possible. Um, not probable, but it's possible. Um, the, the fact is, though, there is absolutely zero evidence uh, for this having happened. Uh, you know, of course, um, the, the, the most famous uh, pseudo-evidence uh, for visitations was, uh, was the Nazca lines, which were studied in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Um, books were written about uh, the, the, these Nazca lines in the Peruvian desert, which show enormous figures and, uh, and some, lots of straight lines. I've seen them from the air and, and on the ground uh, myself. They're very impressive, but um, it's nothing to do with aliens. There are all, all the marker pegs that were used by the people who actually made them in about, if I remember rightly, four or 500 AD, that sort of time ago. The wooden marker pegs are still there, and you can radiocarbon date them. That's how we know when they, they were laid down. Um, so uh, th there is really no evidence that we've been visited. Um, but it is, it's an uh, appealing idea. And I have to say, you know, that's the underlying theme of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which still remains one of my all-time favourite uh, uh, science fiction movies, uh, yes. that um, we were visited. The... I don't know. I, you know, I, when I think about these things, the, the 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 way I think current thinking in astrobiology is is going suggests that we might be the aliens that one day might visit other worlds. Uh, that that maybe just maybe we are uh, in the lead in terms of the development of uh, of um, of intelligent life, or at least. 
uh, in the region of the universe where, given a million years or so, you could get around a lot, i.e. within our galaxy, um, that it, it may well be that we're the only intelligent species in the galaxy. And that sort of, you know, it, 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 does, it does mean that um, uh, if, if you're talking about visitations by higher higher species than it might be us doing it a million years down the track. Um, however, that's pure speculation. Uh, so the answer is yes, it is possible, but uh, no, it's not likely at all. It's an, an extremely unlikely thing to have happened. If somebody can produce evidence, though, that would transform the whole thing and we would really have to rewrite our history books in a big way. Yes, I suppose so. Uh, and some would claim there is evidence that's uh, been analysed and found. It's been portrayed in some of those um, so-called documentaries that appear on, yeah. you know, eleven o'clock at night. Uh, but uh, it's it's a, it's a I suppose it's a question everybody wants to hope is probable. But you've got to be realistic about the the time and the space um, that that is required to be travelled and. And we bring into effect the Drake equation again, which still quite clearly states there is only one planet in all of the universe that we can categorically say carries life. <laughs> and until we can prove otherwise, uh, there's there's very little to support the, uh, the possibility, let, let alone the probability. I mean, microbial life aside, we, yeah. we, you know, in terms of intelligent life, yeah, um, we we are it, and some would question that. <laughs> what a good note to end on. <laughs> Although I must say, um, we, we we talk. You talked about those those lines in in Peru and and that they were created by people. I in modern day thinking, we always assume that ancient peoples weren't real bright. Uh, there's there's a difference between intelligence and knowledge. And I think that we uh, assume that they are dumb because they were ancient. <laughs> but I think the, the 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 capacity to think and the capacity to problem solve uh, improved knowledge over time. And here we are now with the benefits of those uh, earlier peoples building knowledge and and, um, and and creating the capacity to solve problems. So back then. They solved a problem. They they wanted to do something. How do we make giant figurines in in the ground? They they used mathematics. Uh, exactly right, Andrew. And I'm really glad you made that point because uh, one of the you know one of the things when you talk to researchers in archaeology, and um, I had the great privilege back in 2007 of. Uh, of visiting Peru with Peru's leading archaeologist, um, but when you talk to them and talk to them about the Nazca lines, and, and you, you, you know they, they talk about the, the theories that <clears throat> what you're seeing is the the result of alien visitation. What that does is <clears throat> it, it essentially undervalues the capabilities of these people in exactly the way you've described. They they didn't have knowledge, but they had uh, they had intelligence, they had understanding. They, they essentially did this. Uh, you know, they, they, they probably drew the, 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 the figures out on much smaller, uh, either in the, in the ground or on paper or wood or something, and then used effectively a pantograph, a gigantic pantograph, probably made with pegs and string, uh, to recreate them uh, as giant figures. <clears throat> and it was all about um, uh, encouraging their, sh their shamans as they soared through the sky in their, in their intercession with the with the gods, it was very much based on that kind of philosophy. Really, really interesting stuff, mm. um, but uh, nothing to do with aliens. <laughs> and, and one more thing I, I, um, I heard many years ago, uh, I think it might have been in a documentary or an article or something, but if you could create a time machine, go back thousands of years and, and, and pluck a Stone Age baby uh, out of the past and bring it to our time and bring it up as one of us, it would adapt. Yeah, it would. It would be capable, yeah. um, as as capable as anyone else of living in this society. So, it's all about knowledge. It's not lack of intelligence. Um, That's right. Uh, and and, the, and you just got to look at the young children of today, 
and how they adapt to the technology that's been created in such a short period of time. Yeah. Um, they have no issue at all. Uh, we are very adaptable and um, clever creatures and we absorb knowledge like sponges. It's, uh, it's fascinating. When you really look into it, it's just amazing what what we've achieved and what we're capable of and who knows where it's going. I mean, we're, we're just on the cusp of the technological revolution as far as I can tell. Uh, who knows what the world will be like in a hundred or even a thousand years. It's just, um, yeah, it's exciting, but we won't be around to see it, Fred, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> well, we'll try, but <laughs> at this stage, no. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it's always, it makes for a good, um, you know, um, morning tea discussion at the office, I reckon. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up, Fred. Thank you so much. Great pleasure, Andrew. Good to chat and we've covered some great topics today and look forward to doing the same thing next week. <clears throat> Take care, Indeed. Andrew. Look after yourself. You too. Thank you so much, Fred. Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And uh, I, I do encourage you to jump online and record your questions. We love getting the audio questions uh, as much as we enjoy getting the, the written ones, but uh, we, we do love to hear your voices. So don't forget to hit the recorder when you visit our, uh, our website and record your questions. Spacenutspodcast.com is our new URL. Uh, while you're there, you can visit the Space Nuts shop. And uh, I'd also encourage you to um, talk to each other through the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook uh, or uh, follow the Space Nuts page or any of our other social media platforms, uh, Instagram, YouTube, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's it for another week. Thank you for uh, listening in and we look forward to your company next time on another edition of the Space Nuts Podcast. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts Podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Come.